Hi there, as always, it's such a privilege and an honor to be sharing with you today. Uh, this is going to be such a powerful message. We're continuing to talk about identity formation, identity formation, what every child needs. And I encourage you, focus on yourself as a parent who's raising up children for the next generation. Focus on yourself as perhaps a counselor in terms of the standard and blueprint that every family should have. Focus on yourself as someone who's a member of a family, a child growing up in a family right now. And uh, have conversations with your parents, with your siblings, in terms of what kind of family do we want to become? And you can actually shape some of these things. It's important to be having the right conversations. And today we're gonna to be talking about healthy discipline. This is the seventh aspect of functional families, what every child needs. If you look at people who are whole and healthy today, a lot of them will say to you, you know what, my parents were strict, but they were also very loving. You'll see that combo coming through. Lots of love, but also lots of discipline. And they don't complain about it. They don't complain about the discipline. In fact, they're actually grateful for it. So healthy discipline is crucial. And I'm specifically saying healthy because there's unhealthy discipline. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity to get into your word. We thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We pray, Father, that your blueprint would be etched in our hearts today. We open our hearts to you and we say, come and have your way. Teach us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. So this this area of discipline is something that's often misunderstood, isn't it? People have many different approaches to discipline. But the key focus today isn't so much on just discipline, it's on identity formation. So let's just keep that in mind, okay? Um, how we discipline our children will affect the formation of their identity, you know? Uh, as simple as that. How we discipline our children, whether we discipline them or not, will affect the formation of their identity. The important thing to understand is the meaning of the word discipline. We also have it having the same root as disciple. And a disciple is one who sits under teaching, okay? Someone who sits under teaching. So to discipline really is to train, it's to teach. And that's why each time you are disciplining your children, don't see it as punishment. You're not punishing them. You're actually seeing it as a training opportunity or a teaching opportunity. You're basically saying, I am doing this so that this child learns how to become a great adult one day. They learn what to do and what not to do. That's what you're doing. It's a parenting opportunity. It's a training opportunity. It's a teaching opportunity. Now, here's the thing I've realized. You will either discipline your children in the same way by default that your parents disciplined you, okay? So you will parent how your parents parented you because that's all you knew. Or you will go the extreme opposite. That's a reactionary way of parenting or it's what we call compensation parenting. I remember some years ago speaking to a particular woman and I think she was at one of my workshops or something and I engaged with her and I said, uh, what approach do you use when it comes to disciplining your children. And she said, well, we don't really have boundaries, Paul. We use a boundaryless approach. And immediately I asked her, I said, were your parents very strict? She said, Paul, they were strict. That's why we use a boundaryless approach. We kind of let our kids just discover what they need to discover. We need to be very careful of this. We need to be careful of this. We need to discipline our children. We need to parent our children according to the word of God, not in reaction to what we didn't like when we were growing up. So have that conversation with yourself and with people around you just to reflect, to say, what type of parent do I want to be? What's my vision for my parenting? How am I parenting my children today? If you're not a parent, this affects you too because you might be growing up in a family and you can reflect on yourself and you can say, what's going on here? And you can actually give your parents feedback. You can actually say, uh, mom, dad, uh, what's going on here? 
right? And engage with them around these things because no parent is perfect. We want to keep learning um, from each other. Someone who I was coaching the other day actually said that. They said, you know what? My kids actually give me feedback. I say, hey guys, how am I dealing with anger nowadays? Have I improved? Okay. That's what she was saying to her kids. Oh, mom, you could have done it a bit differently. And that's also okay. So God didn't call kids to raise themselves, okay? God actually called parents to do that. God called parents to do that. And one of the key roles of any parent is actually to discipline their children, to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. So child-headed households was not God's idea, okay? There was not God's will for mankind. And the reality is that if you grew up in an environment where you had to raise yourself okay and you weren't parented or you had to grow up too quickly and we'll talk about that next week all right but where you had to grow up too quickly and do certain things that adults do and you didn't really have much of a childhood it impacts your identity today it impacts how you come across today i've seen this happening with a lot of people where they take themselves too seriously where they can't be a child and then i've seen it with other people who are still trying to be kids because they didn't have that opportunity to really be a child, okay? And they get up to a lot of um, mischief as grown-ups, as married men, married women, okay? Uh, Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. This is such a foundational scripture when it comes to discipline, that we must start off children in the way that they should go so that later on in life, they don't depart from it. And you see, children are malleable. Children uh, can be shaped, but you have a window. You have a window. At a certain point, we realize, wait a minute, our kids have now been with us at home uh, for longer than they have uh, remaining with us at home. You know what I'm talking about, right? The moment your kids are now about uh, at least 10 years of age, um, you only have them for maybe another eight years and then they're going. And then they're going maybe to university or, you know, unless you've got kids who will stay living with you into their 30s. But for the most part, they leave home. All right. And so we've got a certain window with them. And even if you've got adult children staying with you, um, they've already got their mind set in terms of this is how I behave. Treat me like an adult, dad. Treat me like an adult, mom. All right. So we've got a window with our children and we need to maximize on that window. Right. I think that sometimes parents send their children to boarding school prematurely and then the children are raised by their peers Okay, those formative years are years where you can shape your children. And one of the key ways of doing so is through disciplining them. So let's talk about different parenting styles that we have, because we've all got different parenting styles, haven't we? All right. Research has found that different parenting styles produce different kinds of children. Now, although it's on a continuum, uh, I'm speaking very generally here, but you will find different children coming out of um, different ways of being parented. Now, uh, it's all on a continuum, like I've said. So try to see what factors are being influenced by the way you are disciplining your children. For example, how you discipline them and, and your parenting style will affect their social skills, will affect levels of delinquency, will affect uh, mental illness and their propensity toward mental illness, um, will affect their self-esteem, will affect impulse behavior, will affect egocentric behavior. OK, um, if you're in a situation where you've got a child who has lots of temper tantrums, for example, all right, and you don't discipline them for having temper tantrums, you're just teaching that child to become a manipulator where the whole world revolves around them and they grow up into adults who end up screaming and shouting at everyone if they want certain things to be done, if they want things to happen their way. All right. So when we talk about the parenting styles, they're different ones. And I will go into these. So let's have a look at the different parenting styles. Um, there's a continuum that we have in terms of low levels of affection rising up to high levels of affection. And then we have on the x-axis uh, to do with the discipline and levels of discipline. So you've got high levels of discipline, authority, 
and low levels of discipline and authority. And here's the thing, you have some parents who show lots of discipline, but no affection at all. And then you have other parents who show lots of affection and no discipline at all. Now, the ones that show a lot of affection, but no discipline, we call that permissive parenting, permissive parenting. This is the indulgent parent. You know, those kinds of parents where they hug their child three times before they send their child to school. And then when they're leaving the school, they feel guilty that they didn't show enough love to their child. And then they just um, overcompensate later on. You know what I'm talking about? And here the child believes that they're the boss. They have temper tantrums and they're very egocentric. That's the type of child that is produced by that. Yet this parent is admired by other people as the one who's always going the extra mile. But they actually are showing lots of affection, but no authority and no discipline. And that child grows up and their identity is that, you know what? I'm in charge here. I don't report to anyone. I'm not under anyone's authority. No one can tell me what to do. I'll just manipulate you if I want you to do something for me. My needs are more important than your needs. Now, the parent that shows a lot of discipline, a lot of authority, but no affection is known as the authoritarian parent, the authoritarian parent. And sometimes we look at these parents and we think, yeah, he was strict. You know, he was very strict. Um, did he love you? Uh, yes, he loved me. Did you feel loved? No, I didn't feel loved. But, but I know he loved me, Paul. Can you see what's going on there? And that ends up impacting you. And I see a lot of people who grew up in these types of environments doing exactly the same thing to their kids. They're wondering, you know, why are these kids today so spoiled? Um, they're not in touch with their emotions very often, okay? Because all they got was authority, but no affection. And then you've got the parent who's called the negligent parent, the negligent parent. And sometimes we can actually call them the absent parent, the absent parent. They might be physically present, but they're emotionally absent. Okay. And this type of parent shows no discipline. They just, they're not interested and no affection. They're there, but they're not there. And they think that, hey, they're being a cool parent. You know, they think they're fine. They think they're okay. But the child sees it as indifferent. And sometimes that child ends up doing certain things like behaving badly on purpose just to get attention from that particular parent. We know it. It's negative attention seeking behavior. Okay. Let me be naughty. Let me do this thing that will just get my father to notice me. Will just get my mother to notice me. And we call it attention seeking behavior. And it, and it is exactly that. And we think the problem is with the child, but it's actually to do with the parenting style. And that's something that I've seen happening quite a bit where I get called into families sometimes and they say, there's a problem we have with our 14 year old. There's a problem we have, Paul, with our 15 year old. Can you please help us? And I begin to counsel this child and I start to ask more than two questions deep. And I realize the problem isn't primarily with the child. The problem is with a dysfunctional family system, okay? I start seeing that, wait a minute, you guys are disciplining your 15-year-old like she's a two-year-old. It doesn't work, and so she's reacting to this. I might start asking this child, so tell me about conversations you have with your parents. Tell me about conversations you've, you've had with your dad that you really enjoyed. Uh, what conversations? So I see that there's absent parenting, there's negligent parenting that's going on. You see, um, if you give your child uh, a test to do or you send them to school and uh, they've told you, hey, mom, dad, I want to um, uh, engage in that interview so I can do this new course that they're showing. And then at the end of the day, they're waiting there wondering, are you going to ask a follow through question? How was the interview? Did you get onto that program or not? If you don't ask them, they see that as indifference. You might say, but I'm not a bad parent. I didn't shout it and scream at them like I see some parents doing. Yes, but what you're doing might be more harmful to them. Remember, we have sins of commission and sins of omission. And sins of omission are those things that we ought to do, but we aren't doing. I remember someone sharing with me uh, quite recently, I was coaching them and they said, my mom was quite dominant, but she was really an amazing mom. She took charge. She was very proactive. But I'm sort of wondering, Paul, about my dad. Because my mom was so dominant, when we grew up, we didn't quite know, what is my dad thinking? What's his viewpoint? What's his perspective on certain things? And that could have impacted that particular family. So being an absent parent isn't necessarily a good thing. Don't measure yourself by what you don't do. 
You know, a lot of people do that. They're so proud of what they don't do, you know, but I don't shout. I don't scream, you know, but ask yourself, what are you supposed to be doing? Are you as engaged as you're supposed to be engaged? So our goal is to be an authoritative parent, an authoritative parent. This is a parent who is strong when it comes to discipline, but also strong when it comes to affection. And those two things can work together at the same time. I remember speaking to someone who I was coaching recently and I asked this individual, can you tell me something? What are you like in terms of your parenting style? And this person said to me, Paul, I have my days. Sometimes I'm very affectionate. On other days, I can be very strict and I lose it and I can scream at my kids. And I said, uh, what about doing both at the same time? What about being firm with your children, not shouting and screaming at them, but disciplining them, but with affection? And this person asked me, is that possible, Paul? Is that possible? Yes, it's possible because that's how God is with us. You see, many parents make the mistake of punishing their kids through emotional withdrawal, right? It's important that we actually are firm with our children but we are doing it with love and affection at the same time. That's why the best type of discipline is where you discipline your children and straight afterwards you can give them a hug. Uh, a lot of the times when I've disciplined my children, and I won't go into the details in terms of methods, um, but a lot of times when I've disciplined my children, afterwards they're the sweetest of kids, you know, and there's that warmth and they're wanting to connect with me. Now, the mistake a lot of parents make at that point is, let me ignore my child and do my own thing because they misbehaved. So I'm gonna show them that dad is angry. No, don't do that. You exercise the correct form of discipline, but you still show them affection. That's exactly how God is with us. And when we're parenting our children, we ought to parent them as God is a father to us. So with authoritarian parenting, what happens? You believe kids should be seen and not heard. How many of you grew up in families like that? I've seen people who've grown up in those kinds of families. Today, they're sitting on mancos. They're sitting on excos in the workplace and they do exactly the same thing. They sit there with this blank look on their face. You know, I'll only speak when my boss speaks, you know, and then I'll make sure I agree with my boss. Why? That person was raised up in a family where they were told children must be seen, not heard. And they transfer that onto relationships they have today with authority figures. And that's not healthy. So you believe that kids should be seen and not heard. No, train up your kids to be confident today, to share their opinions, to speak their mind, but to do so in a respectful manner. Otherwise, you'll be surprised one day when you say, why are you so afraid of your boss? Well, that's how you raise that child. Okay, when it comes to rules, you believe it's my way or the highway. Do this, why? Because I told you so, right? They want to understand. There are a lot of adults today who like to know why they're doing what they're doing. So explain to them the benefits of doing it that way. Because you want to raise up children who understand how to make moral choices. That's what discipline is about. You're training up the next generation to make moral choices for themselves. Not to do things out of fear. And with authoritarian parenting style, you don't take your child's feelings into consideration. There's no room for them to express their feelings, okay? They're just disciplined straight away uh, in anger very often. Now, the recommended approach is authoritative parenting, as I've mentioned before. And with this type of parenting, it's high on affection and high on discipline. So with authoritative parenting, you put a lot of effort into creating and maintaining a positive relationship with your child. And let me emphasize this. It's been found that children are more likely to obey their parents when the emotional bond is strong between parent and child. And the mistake a lot of parents are making today is they focus so much on the discipline, but there's no emotional bond. And so what ends up happening is your children obey you out of fear. How many of you grew up in that environment? They obey you out of fear, but as soon as they leave home, they go the opposite in the opposite direction. I know people who I was at university with who went to schools where they were so protected right through their teen teenage years, okay? They came from strict homes and they literally became crazy. They grew, they, they, they became mad when they were at varsity. They didn't know how to make good moral choices, right? We don't want to produce children like this. Right. So in authoritative parenting, you're putting a lot of effort into creating and maintaining that positive relationship with your child. You explain the reasons behind your rules 
And if you're feeling angry, then give yourself a moment so you can calm down, so you can adequately explain the rules. All right. Um, you enforce rules and you give consequences, but you take your child's feelings into consideration. You're also very careful about disciplining your child if they didn't know that what they did was wrong because you hadn't explained it to them. It's so important when we're disciplining our children to be very clear about what the standards are and to not keep having ch standards changing. Otherwise, kids get confused. I remember uh, one of my boys saying to me, and rightfully so, saying, sometimes with dad, um, he, can, he can sort of like joke around with you when you're joking around with him and you say certain things. But if he's not in a good mood, you can get disciplined for that same thing that you did on a different day. And I'm taking that feedback because my children should never be confused about where the line is, where the boundary is. They should never be confused about what the rules in the house are. So this is so, so crucial and so important. So uh, authoritative parenting is what we actually recommend. It's actually what we recommend. Now with permissive parenting, the, ind the indulgent parent, uh, you set rules, but rarely enforce them. You don't enforce the rules that you've actually set. Okay. You don't give out consequences very often. So you say, don't do that. Don't do that. And sometimes you might even scream at them and be this helpless parent. But you, there are no consequences for what the child is actually doing. And I like saying this to parents that you're actually very powerful. You're more powerful than you actually think. You're very powerful because you've got the power to dish out the consequences. But a lot of times parents just act so, so helpless, like they're powerless. Let me encourage you parents, take your power back. Let me encourage you, those of you who are counseling, don't just go into a counseling situation and, and assume it's all the child's fault. Because a lot of times it's actually to do with how they're being disciplined or not being disciplined. Now, with permissive parenting, you think your child will learn best with little interference from you. Let me tell you something, especially when your kids are 10 years of age and below, you need to be very involved because you're shaping their personality. As they get older, you want them to uh, explore certain things. You want to ask them why they made certain decisions and so on, and you can engage with them. But I'm telling you right now, uh, those of you with younger kids, you need to be extremely involved at that particular level. As your kids get into their tweens, you now really want to make sure that the emotional bond is really strong so that they do things, but they're doing things because they don't want to let mom and dad down. They're doing things because... Um, they understand the moral consequences of their behavior. They, they get you in terms of that. Now, you also have uninvolved parenting, right? the neglectful parent. And um, this is the parent who has this approach. You don't ask your child about school or homework. You know, because it's like, hey, it's a laissez affair approach. You know, they'll do it. They don't need me to be checking up on them. I don't like being micromanaged, so I mustn't micromanage them. But let me tell you something. The way the child interprets that is my dad is not interested. Right? You might be trying to communicate that. I trust you. I know you've done it. But the way that child interprets it is my dad is not interested. My mom is not interested. Okay. You really know where your child is or who she's with. You, you really know. Oh, who, who do they go to? Whose house do they go to? What, do you know the parents? Do you know the practices there? I've grown up in situations where I remember visiting a particular friend of mine and I remember being exposed to certain things I hadn't seen before. You know, his dad uh, had divorced his mom and his dad now had a girlfriend, right? So this guy had like a stepmom who was there, but the parents weren't yet married. And, you know, here's me like observing things. Imagine you're like nine years old, you're playing with this friend of yours and so on. And I'm seeing all sorts of interesting things happening between this, um, this guy you know, the father and his girlfriend. And I'm sort of observing it, you know, not, not the extreme things. I know some of you, your imagination is kind of rolling, but I was kind of like seeing things that I don't think I should have been seeing. And I remember as a young boy, it was fascinating. It was like, is that what happens? Is that what, is you know? And you know how you start interpreting because there's some things, you know, as a black kid growing up, there's certain things you don't see happening in public. And then now you hear and you, you look, is this what white folk do? Oh, okay. It was just interesting for me. But the point I'm making is that you need to know where your children are going. You need to know what their practices are. Uh, there was a lot of binge uh, alcohol abuse uh, in the UK some time back. And I remember reading an article, a lot of binge drinking happening amongst youth. 
and where they had access to the alcohol was not actually um, out in the shops or nightclubs, etc. It was actually at home in the drinking cabinet, okay, at people's houses. So do you know what's going on at your children's friends' homes and what they have access to? I remember uh, growing up and my parents were friends with a particular cabinet minister. He's, he's late uh, now, but I remember we went to their house and um, their son took us up to the attic and he was like, let me show you, let me show you my father's gun. And there he was and he showed, you know, he, he showed me um, his dad's gun. Now, I don't know if it was loaded or not, but that's what boys do. Are you aware of the weapons that are there? So with the uninvolved parent, there are different types of uninvolved parents. There's the one that's very neglectful, but there's also the one that's, um, that can be quite indulgent. They can be quite permissive in what they allow you to do. Um, so <clears throat> make sure you're spending time with your child and you actually know who they're with because the uninvolved parent doesn't spend much time with their child. Now, for further study of these parenting styles, because this is such powerful stuff, you can look at some of the work that was done uh, in the 70s and 80s by Diana Baumwright. She really developed uh, you know, powerful models around these styles. Uh, you can also go online and do some of these tests around parenting styles to see what your style is. You can also look at the work done by uh, Maccoby and Martin around parenting styles. There's some models that will just talk about maybe three main parenting styles. There's some that actually break them down uh, a bit further. So now my question to you is, what does discipline actually do for a child? What are the benefits of disciplining a child? And as I take you through this process, as we look at the word of God, I'd like you to reflect on your childhood also and see what the gaps, cracks and leakages are in your life because of overcorrection that you got from your parents or where you had lots of discipline but no affection. Um, sometimes it's even to do with what was modeled by the same gender parent, okay? Uh, because as you grow up, you then think to yourself, oh, okay, that's a man's job or that's a woman's job. Uh, and you can explore some of these things. There's some men who are afraid of women today because of the relationship they had with a domineering mother as they were growing up. So the first thing that discipline does for a child is discipline teaches a child to submit to authority. Okay, part of your identity is what's called social identity. That sense of, I'm part of this group. I belong to this group of people. This is where I belong. And in this group, we have certain rules. There are things we do and things we don't do. This is the culture of our family. What is culture? It's your values, your norms, and your beliefs. So when a child gets this through discipline, they begin to understand that I'm not a law unto myself. They begin to understand that when I go to the workplace and I'm now working for Coca-Cola, I'm now working for McDonald's, I'm now working for um, Standard Bank, whatever organization they're working for, this is how we do things here. They've got that mindset. Um, if a child doesn't get disciplined when they're young, you start seeing the antisocial behavior creeping in and you wonder what's going on here. I'm telling you, you can go to schools. Research has been carried out on different preschoolers and they see a pattern. They actually see a pattern that these kids who are behaving like this, can you see the type of homes they're coming from? Right. Now you have exceptions. So I know some of you be like, I was raised like this, but look how I turned out. That's God's grace. Begin to thank God for that because there are many people who were raised in exactly the same way and they didn't turn out like you. And maybe you think you turned out really great and that's fine, but then you get married and then your spouse is like, hey, how come you're so detached? Hey, how come you've got this issue? How come you've got that issue? Just because you're getting straight A's doesn't mean you're whole in your soul. Okay, so maybe the way you're measuring your wholeness is incorrect. So discipline helps the child to yield to authority. Secondly, discipline gives a child moral boundaries, moral boundaries. This is such a key factor, isn't it? When it comes to identity formation, just knowing that there are certain boundaries. I know that when we give our kids boundaries, even though we're thinking to ourselves, oh, they're not going to like these boundaries. A lot of times they're like, cool. And I look at my wife and I, 
We should have just said that up front. That's what they needed. Can you see the peace that comes with the boundaries? Hey guys, these are your time limits this weekend when it comes to screen time. When it comes to gadgets time, these are the time limits. Children need that. They want to know what the boundaries are. And when they don't have clear boundaries, what happens? They feel insecure. Do you remember that research that was carried out amongst, uh, I think it was preschool age kids, and uh, there was a fence around a particular playground. And when it was fenced, what would happen? They would play freely everywhere because there was that particular boundary. When the fence was removed, they would huddle up close to each other quite near the middle of those particular playgrounds. What is that speaking of? Children feel insecure when there are no boundaries. I want to encourage you as parents, give your children boundaries. And when it comes to disciplining our children, there are different types of boundaries. For example, we have space boundaries. I like communicating space boundaries to my children, where I literally say to them, hey guys, this is not your space. This is my vehicle. So the way you are behaving, I don't like this in my vehicle. You need to stop. Otherwise, there'll be consequences, right? So that's an example of a space boundary uh, when it comes to children. We set limits for them also when it comes to, hey, you need to go to bed now. Right? It's time to go to bed. Hey, you've had enough game time now. You're setting limits. And what that is doing to the child, it's helping them to understand that there's what we call moral boundaries. There's certain things I can't just do. If you just say, hey, just beat each other up and do whatever you want, they begin to do that outside of the home. Whatever you allow them to do in the home, they're learning this is what's okay in society. Because as a child is growing up, they, they look at their parents for cues. And whatever the parents set as the law in the home, the kids realize, oh, this is how you treat people. Oh, you never speak to people like this. One of the things that I'll discipline my kids strongly for is if they're rude to their mom, if they're disrespectful to their mother. Because if I allow that type of behavior, what are they going to be like one day when they are relating to their wives, right? Um, that's very important. A lot of people who are wife beaters today, they grew up seeing this. You know, and in their minds, it was, oh, it's okay to do so. It's culturally fine. My wife feels more loved when I beat her up. It's that mindset that a lot of people grow up with. A lot of people who are cheating on their spouses today, they saw that when they were growing up. I remember counseling one individual. He said, Paul, that was the norm for us. We would see like our uncles with someone on the side all the time. So you could see that their consciences were seared in this particular area. So Discipline reinforces and trains a child's conscience. That's to do with your moral boundaries. How far can you go mentally? What's okay to think and not to think, right? Uh, discipline teaches a child to live by conviction and not by their emotions. A child might feel like beating up his brother, but if you discipline that child for doing so, they realize I can't just live out what I'm feeling. I need to control myself. So they learn self-control through being disciplined and becomes part of their identity. We identify people based on their convictions. We know this is this person's conviction. This is this person's religious practice. This is this person's uh, religious conviction around the following issues. Um, so uh, we identify people by their convictions. So it's part of your identity. Your moral boundaries become your identity. It's that badge you wear that no one can actually see visibly, but it gives you moral authority. It gives you moral authority, which is so much more powerful than uh, positional authority. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about the third thing that discipline actually does. So let's talk about the third thing that discipline actually does for a child. Discipline embeds the principle of sowing and reaping. If you look in your Bibles, uh, or you can look at the screen, in Galatians 6 verses 7 to 8, very powerful verse uh, that a lot of us are familiar with. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. This is so crucial. So what happens is that when you discipline a child, you're actually showing that particular child that these are the consequences of fleshly behavior. Right? When you reward a child, because rewarding is part of the disciplining process, isn't it? Because you're rewarding a child for doing good. 
you're showing them that there are good consequences for good behavior. That's what you're actually doing. And a lot of times when people don't get disciplined, unfortunately, they end up thinking, I can get away with anything. I'm not going to experience consequences. You know, you look at someone like Oscar Pistorius. And uh, for those who aren't aware of Oscar Pistorius, I think it was about maybe seven and a half years ago. So where he, uh, he ended up murdering his girlfriend. And it's interesting because people who knew Oscar, they will talk about how this guy would get up to nonsense. This guy would do all sorts of things and would get away with it. So it was a bit of a time bomb that was about to explode. And so when we don't nip certain things in the bud, I'm telling you right now, we experience the consequences later on. And that's why today people have got adult children and they're complaining about this. Why is he like this? Why is he like that? And I would encourage parents to take ownership and to actually say, did I follow through on the consequences when it came to misbehavior? Did I reinforce our practices in terms of morality or did I let them get away with things did I keep bailing out my children something important to think about the fourth thing that discipline does for a child is discipline communicates love if you look at Hebrews 12 verses 4 through to 9 it says in your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, now watch this, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. So parents should discipline their children. Parents should rebuke their children because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So when you're not disciplining your children, it's a sign of not showing them love. And he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. So that's sonship. I'm not responsible to discipline other people's children, but I'm responsible for my kids. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? So you can see the mindset here by the writer, by what we see in scripture, is that discipline is normal. That's what fathers are supposed to be doing. If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. I want to I challenge you fathers. Can you see the emphasis on fathers? Fathers, discipline your children. Okay. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? So the child feels that someone is looking out for me. They feel like someone is looking out for me. Someone has my best interests at heart when they're disciplining me. Okay, this is why you sometimes have children misbehaving just to get attention, even if it is discipline. They'll be happy with that. I remember the one time quite recently, one of my kids literally started a fight with me, a physical fight. I mean, they were playing around, messing around, but it was like they were going to do anything to me. And they was like, Dad, you're not giving me enough attention. So come on, come on. And they started teasing me. And of course, I responded and so on. It was kind of like a playful thing. Of course, he came out second best. But the point I'm wanting to make is that a lot of times children will do certain things because they feel like your response, even if it's a painful response, like one of my kids experienced, but your response just gives them that attention. And they would rather have that, even if it's painful. Okay? So they don't view it negatively. They don't view discipline negatively when that discipline is done properly. In fact, the Bible says they'll respect you for it. That's why it says we had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. Sometimes we lose respect. We lose the respect uh, from our children because we're not disciplining them. The fifth thing that discipline does is it protects a child. It protects their child, the, the child. You are actually protecting your child from himself and you're actually protecting them for others okay on behalf of others because if you allow a child to get away with anything they can cause harm and you know sometimes we've got this thing of let me protect my children from those naughty people out there and i'm thinking to myself no sometimes we have to protect those people out there from our children because all those so-called naughty kids out there they've also got parents 
would think, oh, my child is the best. My child is amazing. <laughs> okay. So uh, sometimes it's to do with that. Don't go this default of how are those bad children out there going to influence my kids? Sometimes you have to think to yourself, how can my kids also influence certain people negatively out there? So you're protecting your child from themselves, but you're also protecting them for other people. Okay. For other people's sake. So uh, sometimes we look at our children and we think, and I talk to my wife about it and we say, this thing, this attitude needs to be uprooted from this child. So you don't just discipline for behavior. You also discipline when it comes to certain attitudes, because I'm telling you something, a child might not steal, a child might not be outwardly rude, but they might have a root of rebellion. And if that thing is not uprooted, it will cause you a lot of sorrow one day. Um, now, discipline will protect them from grow, going astray. If you look at Psalms 119 verse 67, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. So discipline will save them from hell and from the calamity of the wicked. Uh, you see in the book of Psalms 94 verse 12 to 13, it says, Blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach from your law. You grant them relief from the days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. Proverbs 23 verse 13 to 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. Those of you who are withholding discipline, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Sometimes we've got this thing where we, we, we are afraid of disciplining our kids, whatever methods you use. And so on. I'm not talking about methods today, but we're afraid of disciplining our children because we think oh, it might harm them. It might harm them. It might hurt them just because the child is crying. OK, no, let them experience the sorrow for wrongdoing. Don't try to protect them from that. And those of you who are very warm uh, people who don't like conflict, don't make the mistake of being so firm so firm with them right and rightfully so and then afterwards you feel bad that you're so firm and you take it all away by saying sorry mommy was just upset you know uh, you guys are actually really cool and then you take back everything you had done no if you need to be firm with your children be firm with them but also be loving at the same time but don't undo what you had done all right um <clears throat> then we go on to uh verse 14 of proverbs 23 punish them with the rod and save them from death this is so important punish them with the rod and save them from death if we don't discipline our children then we won't save them from death we won't save them from themselves man is depraved ladies and gentlemen uh, man has got wickedness in his heart and uh, we need to discipline our children so that the folly is removed. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 32 says, Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. I'd rather the Lord disciplines me now than me being finally condemned with the world. Um, the sixth thing that discipline does for a child. Discipline trains a child to make sound moral choices, to make sound moral choices. Um, and they end up becoming wise as a result of this. In Proverbs 22 verse 15, the Bible says, uh, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Uh, a lot of children are foolish. They make foolish decisions with regards to all sorts of things. So folly is bound up in the heart of a child. I know that the humanists will disagree with that. They'll say every child is good. There's goodness in every single person. That's humanism, okay? The Bible says folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline actually drives it out. Now, um, let's have a look at the seventh uh, principle, the seventh thing that discipline does for a child. Discipline produces fruitfulness in a child. Discipline will help them to enjoy life more fully. In Hebrews 12 verse 11, the Bible says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So discipline trains us 
you know even if you're talking about discipline when it comes to um running for example or getting fitter or cycling whatever form of exercise that you engage in it, it's not easy what is discipline what is discipline when we talk about being a disciplined person it's continuing to do what you've pre-decided is best for you to do despite your emotional state so uh for example i've got track training this evening i'm i've committed i'm going to track training it's going to be a tough set that i need to do but guess what i've got that discipline where i'll follow through and do it regardless of how i'm feeling at the time why i want to experience the fruit that comes with following through and it's the same when we're disciplining our children it's not pleasant it's not pleasant for the child it's not pleasant for you as a parent but when it's done properly you will look back and you'll be like i'm so glad i did it often when we discipline our children my wife and i will look at ourselves after and say can you just see the peace can you see there's such peace in the house right now because we followed through with it in john 15 verse 2 it says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful so why do we discipline our children is it because they're bad kids no it's not because they're bad kids they're actually fruitful children but we need to prune them so that they become even more fruitful so you want to keep reminding your children you want to keep reminding your children and this also applies to you if you're a school teacher by the way you want to keep reminding them and reinforcing these biblical principles and here's what i want to say go by the word of god go by the word of god when it comes to discipline there's certain things the word of god says are okay to do all right sometimes the law of the land kicks in and some of you might be listening to this and you're from countries that say corporal punishment is banned in the particular country so we always encourage uh, parents when you're disciplining your child to explain to them do you know why you're being disciplined right now can you see what you did wrong all right and then you discipline them and then you show them affection straight afterwards you show them that you know what um i still love you you're my child and i'm doing this for your own good and you will see the connection that you have make sure that the form of discipline that you use is appropriate for the age of the child you need to think through that that's so important make sure also that the form of discipline that you're using is appropriate for the child's personality okay uh sometimes if a child is uh, is very introverted and you say go and have a time out just chill in your room for them that's a reward they'll go into their room they'll just be reading and that's what they actually wanted they wanted space from you okay i know a parent was telling me recently yeah we would take our son's phone from him but it didn't make a difference he didn't care about that but with some people like when you remove certain things and it's a good approach to use as the kids get older what happens it's like that's that's like you know they'll just be an obedient child you know forever when you remove the particular thing so find creative ways of disciplining your children but make sure it's lots of discipline but it's discipline with lots of affection at the same time now <clears throat> I've got some powerful crafted prayers that I want us to pray together now uh, with regards to ourselves, those of us who are parents, and to pray strongly in agreement. You can also just listen to these and just think and reflect on your own childhood with regards to some of these things. If you want access to my crafted prayers, you can go on YouTube. They're there if you just say, Paul Nyamuda Crafted Prayers. These ones are from the crafted prayers I did called My Parenting. And it's a section on discipline. You can also get them from our website. You can also get the book on crafted prayers. You can get it as an ebook from Amazon. I encourage you engage with these uh, crafted prayers. They're very powerful when it comes to praying. Are you ready? Um, Father, your word says that the rod of discipline will drive folly far away in Proverbs 22 verse 15. So I thank you for the impact of discipline in our home. Your word says in Isaiah 54 verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of of your children i receive this for our children in jesus name they will indeed know complete peace and shall be taught directly by the holy spirit may you come with your holy spirit may you come by your spirit as we discipline our children give us wisdom in helping them to respect authority figures and help us to know how to respond when they question authority figures today i choose to stop sweating the small stuff not everything has to be on 
percent. Yes, good grades and avoiding drugs are important battles to fight, not how fast they eat or their preference and hairstyles. Help me, Lord, to keep the main thing, the main thing. May we not fight about small things and then lose the relationship. Forgive me, Lord, for compensation parenting, where I've tried to be the extreme opposite of what I didn't like in my parents. Help me to parent in a manner reflecting your heart and not in reaction to what I have experienced. Help us to remember that we are their parents first before we try to be the popular kid in the house. Forgive me for the debilitating rules that I've created for my children based on my own fears or ignorance. May you give us empowering rules that bring life, that bring protection, and that bring security. Deliver us, Lord, from passive parenting, the tendency to show too much affection and no discipline at all. Uh, that that way of being a permissive parent, an indulgent parent. Uh, deliver us from this, Lord. Deliver us from authoritarian, authoritarian parenting where there's too much discipline and no affection. Deliver us from being the absent parent or the negligent parent where we show no affection and, and no discipline to our children. Forgive us for when we're physically present, but we're emotionally absent. Help us, Lord, to be authoritative parents who show lots of affection and lots of discipline. Help us to create a distinct culture in our home, Lord. Show us how to do this by the things we teach, the things we model, the things we measure, the things we inspect, the things we reward, the things we celebrate. Show us how to create culture by how we respond or react to situations. Show us how to create culture by how we discipline our children, what we discipline them for. Give us creative ways of creating rituals that reinforce and embed the culture that you want for our family, Lord. Help us to create culture by design and not by default. Help us to establish healthy boundaries, Lord, with our children by clearly communicating to them guidelines and rules for various spaces at home. Give us clarity as we communicate how we want various areas to be like, how we want the car to be like, how we want the bedrooms to be like, the bathrooms, neatness, ambience, general noise levels. May we be clear in what we communicate, Lord God. Help us to establish healthy boundaries by setting appropriate limits where necessary. May we be clear when it comes to minimum and maximum boundaries, Lord. May we be clear with regards to moral boundaries. Show us how to prepare our children for the world and show us how to protect them from the world. As parents, Lord, we choose to set boundaries to protect what is important in our lives and to avoid the stress that comes from collapsed boundaries and enmeshment. Thank you, Lord, that our children will feel secure because they have boundaries. May we model healthy self-respect boundaries in order to protect our children from abusive situations, Lord. Help them to respect themselves and to, and to live morally as a result of the self-respect. May we show them how to be assertive and not passive. May we show them how to stand their ground. May we show them also, Lord, how to be assertive but not aggressive. May we model good boundaries with regards to stewardship of our health. May this be outworked, Lord, in what we eat and what we drink. May we be responsible as role models, Lord. May we discipline them through our role modeling. May we train them up through our role modeling. Give us wisdom and insight in instilling healthy body boundaries, Lord. May our children grow up with a clear sense of what they can permit people to see and what is private. May the information boundaries be clear as we parent our children. Forgive us for unwise overshare. Show us what is just between between the parents and what is not for the children. Help us as parents to be self-aware with regards to energy levels. May we have healthy task and energy boundaries. May we also pass this on to our children. May they know when it is time to stop, when they've played too much or when they've even worked too much. May our whole family know what is draining us and how this is impacting us. May we as parents know how much work is too much. May we never become workaholics. May we never communicate to our children that our work is more important than them. Our phones are more important than them. Help us, Lord, to accurately diagnose 
the root problems with our children. We know that how we diagnose a problem determines how we solve it. May we pray for accuracy. We pray for accuracy, Lord, right now, especially during times of conflict, that we'll speak the truth to each other, Lord, that there will be clarity. Help us, Lord, to help our children to fight fairly. We pray for effective conflict management in our home. Help us when there's conflict around status, when I feel dishonored by my children, show me how to respond and not to react. May I never lower my standard when they push my buttons. Father, show me how to enforce my authority in a godly way. When there is conflict around a task or a goal, give me wisdom in managing this type of conflict. When there is conflict around a process or a methodology, may you help me to keep the main thing the main thing. Help me to pick up if there are any negative attitudes, but may I always keep the big picture in mind. Help us, Lord, when it comes to handling interpersonal conflict in our home. May we never fight destructively in front of our children. May we model effective conflict handling skills. And Father, I pray right now for those who grew up in destructive environments where their parents would fight in front of their children. I pray, Father God, that they would be healed from those wounds. Father, may you help us all to grow in emotional containment, learning how to manage our emotions. Show us, Lord God, how to deal with emotional dysregulation, Lord, that results in escalation of our emotions and help us, Lord, to take time to return to balance. Show us how to do this. Teach us, Lord, teach us in our families how to self-soothe and not act out in destructive manners. We pray, Father God, for these things to take place in our lives. Father, I pray that in parenting our children, we would have the courage to have difficult conversations with them. May we talk about the elephant in the room. May we confront issues with our children. Forgive me for being the subject changer because of my own emotional discomfort. Father, may I never withhold affection from my children as a form of discipline. May they always know that they are loved unconditionally. Forgive me for sometimes being a withholder when it comes to my emotions. I commit to trying to catch them doing something right and then celebrating it. I commit to giving my children feedback on positives, not just on negatives. I commit to teaching my children proactively instead of reactively. I will help my children to pre-decide their behavior. Help us, Father God, to find creative and effective ways of rewarding our children when they do good and celebrating them when they do good. I embrace the authority that you have given me, Lord. No will mean no. I thank you that I'm powerful as a parent. I thank you for powerful parents, Lord, in this nation and the nations of the world. I thank you for your blueprint for family. I commit to only giving a consequence that I'm willing to enforce. Help me to enforce consequences, Lord God in my family. I commit to working as a team with my spouse. Help us, Lord, to be in agreement as to how we are raising our children. Help us to work together, Lord God, knowing that discipling our children will come through disciplining them to a large extent. And I thank you, Father God, that disciplining children can be more stressful for one parent than the other. Help us as we do these particular things, Lord Jesus. Help us. Father, I pray that we may never lead our children astray. If we are doing this in any way, may you please show us, Lord. May we not wound them emotionally and let us never teach or model things that are against your word, Lord God. Help us, Father, as we go about these things. Father, may you help us to be role models for our children. May they see us praying. May they see us overcoming trials. May they see us being generous. May they see us loving each other. May they see our tenderness and our respect for each other. May they imitate the good you have done in us. I commit to avoid all unbiblical forms of discipline, such as slapping, pulling ears or hair, jerking, shaking, uh, lifting them up suddenly off the floor, grabbing suddenly, squeezing, squeezing arms too tight, pinching, biting, or any other eye for an eye method. We won't stoop down to that level. We'll operate as adults, Lord God. In a world where many do not believe in discipline, I choose to continue discipling my children biblically. I declare that my children will experience the positive life-giving fruit 
privilege of loving biblical forms of discipline. I choose to renew my mind concerning what good discipline is and what it looks like. I pray these prayers right now for every family that is watching this particular message. I pray and I speak blessing over our families. May you birth a movement, Lord, where family life is restored according to your word. I pray this right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. I want to encourage you to go through the notes, go through the prayer strategies that we put out and pray through this because this is so instrumental when it comes to identity formation. Find out what's your parenting style. Is it working? Is it not working? I encourage you to be an authoritative parent. If you've been wounded as you've been growing up, you're listening to this message and you're thinking to yourself, sure, there are things that I actually need to work through. I need healing with regards to these things. Maybe some of it in involves releasing and forgiving your parents. Maybe some of it involves engaging with them if they're still alive. But most of all, take these issues to the Lord and allow him to bring healing to your soul so that you understand that you can truly embrace an identity that comes from God, your God-given identity. This is so powerful if you go through this and you process it in such a manner. I also want to encourage you, this has been a great season where we are going through these messages and we're doing it online. And we're going to continue for a while, for a, num for a few more weeks we'll be doing so. Um, but keep looking out on our website. We will announce to you, we're aware of the lockdown rules for uh, stage one. We will announce to you clearly when we are going to resume certain services in the normal way and we're going to stagger it and do it we're going to phase it in in a powerful way so just look out on our website the next um, number of days and you will see that uh, that particular announcement and we'll be sharing with you what we will be doing and the way forward we want to do it prayerfully we don't want to do it in reaction to government announcements or president announcements we want to do it prayerfully and carefully as we rebuild keep praying for us we believe in god for that land that piece of land and I believe that we will soon purchase it and be able to also start building. So please be praying for wisdom and direction for us. God bless you all. Keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. And I want to thank those of you who've been doing so throughout these lockdown uh, periods that we've been having. Uh, keep giving into our building fund. Keep giving, tithing. Many of you are benefiting from these messages. Uh, tithe into the storehouse, as the Bible says. I want to encourage you to continue doing so. God bless you. We love you lots. Amen. Thank you.